Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. We're glad to have you, and um, thank you for joining us. We're continuing our series on establishing priorities. I know we've had a couple of uh, uh, services I wasn't here, and so th this has been stretched out a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, you can still pick it up. Uh, last week, uh, Chris uh, ministered. We're glad he was able to do that. And a couple weeks before that, I think um, uh, Jeff or Bill, brother, Bill, brother Bill did, and um, so praise the Lord. We're, we're talking about our priorities of life, and um, we talked about um, our main text here is, but Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Luke chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. And as we've said in the beginning, um, that you know, this scripture gives us some insight that there are priorities. You know, what Martha was doing was proper. It was good to do. But, it, you know, we have to establish when the, the right thing is done at the right time. What is the right priority for the circumstance or the time that you're doing it in? Uh, at that time, sitting at the feet of Jesus was more of a priority than serving food. Not that serving food was wrong. That was a hospitality issue. That was something that you would normally do. But it was more important to be at the feet of Jesus than to serve food. And so Martha, uh, Mary was going to stay at Jesus' feet. Martha was not happy. And Jesus uh, reproved her for it and, you know, and, and kindly. But said, you know, you're cumbered, you're cumbered about with many things, but she's chosen that good part. And so it was more important to do that. And so we started with this way. Uh, the the priorities of life we've covered so far are God is your number one priority. Your relationship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ is the number one priority you have in life. Second priority of life is your spouse. And um, that, you know, what about my kids? They come after your spouse. If it's not good between you and your wife or you and your husband, uh, then it's not going to be good for your kids. So it's important that there's a good relationship between the husband and wife so that your kids are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen? And then thirdly was your children. Your children, you know, you can't put things before your kids. A lot of times we put our jobs before our kids. And it doesn't mean you don't work. It doesn't mean you don't have a, a job. It just means that you just don't put your whole, whole life in front of your, your children. Um, there are people who, you know, I'm making a buck. I can't get home. I've got to be here for this. And they never see their kids do anything in life. Uh, they never see they never see them graduate. They don't see them do this. They don't see them do that because they just say, "Well, I can't, I, you know, I can't do this." You know, uh, there's got to be time made. I understand you can't make it all about that. You can't live your life where you you miss work all the time because you're doing something for your kids, but you can't miss all your kids all the time because you're you're working. There has to be a place there um, that you work it in, and that because it's important to them. And let's face it, you only get one shot at that one. You don't, get, you don't get another shot at t-ball with your kids because they, they age out. Or, you know, you don't get a shot at graduation from high school because they age out. They, they graduate. There's things that, that you can't go back and have a do-over, okay? <coughs> so don't live with regret. And if you, if you did mess up or you missed it, ask God to forgive you, and he will. And then you can go on, okay? Then our next one, which is what we're going to cover tonight, uh, is your personal intimate relationship with your church. Why is that before your job? Because uh, where you go to church is, is a, can be a matter of life and death. It's imperative that you have the right place that you go to church. Okay? Um, you just don't go to church because there's a good job there. All right? Um, you know, we've, we've had uh, people in our church in the past who wouldn't take jobs because they would not leave the church. Because they know that the, what they learned at the church is why they got where they got in the first place. They weren't, about, they weren't willing to give that up for a better job or what, you know, what the company wanted them to do, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so um, you may not have a good church where you're, you're planning on moving to. It may not be a church that believes like you, you need uh, to hear and to be taught and to raise your family under. And so uh, your, church, your church relationship is important and imperative. Can you say amen? I'm just going to read a few scriptures about the church. Now, um, the word used for church in the New Testament is used to refer to the building or actually the gathering of the people in the building. 
and it's also referred to as you know us as people and, you know we, we get the we get that thing i don't need to go to church because i am the church hogwash okay jesus went to church he didn't call it church it was a synagogue and paul wrote to the church says forsake not the assembling yourself of yourselves together as is the manner of some and then when you're come to paul said that when you're come together i'll be in the midst of you the gathering of the saints in, in a location meeting place is, is referred to in the New Testament as the church. The people individually are referred to as the church, corporately referred to as the church. Okay? So to say you don't need the gathering together because you are the church is a, is a partial truth, which makes it a falsehood. Okay? Partial truth is, is still a falsehood. It's not true. Um, you, you know, if you're commanded not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, then you are not to forsake the assembling together. And Paul's mindset in that was that they met and they met in homes. He, he would talk to the church, the collective church in places. His Who's, who's going to feed the, the widows and stuff. You know, the, the disciple says, it's not meat that we should take this time. I choose that seven men among you full of the faith and full of the Holy Ghost to attend in this matter. We're going to attend to the word of God in prayer. But see, there was something, the daily ministry, they were meeting. Okay? They were meeting. But when they came together in the book of Corinth, I mean, in the church of Corinth, in the book of Corinthians, Paul rebuked them for getting together and not serving the Lord's table properly. There was a gathering. So we see throughout the New Testament that the focal um, social interaction of the church in the wilderness. The Bible referred to that. In the New Testament, using that word. Now you understand, we've talked about this many times before, that the, um, the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, some Chaldean. And then, when, and then they, because Greek had become the common language of the world, that they, they translated that that Old Testament, what we, 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 what we refer to as the Old Testament, into Greek. And, and, and that was uh, Koine Greek. And it's referred to as the Septuagint. And so whenever they found that the, the, the group of people, whatever Hebrew word they used to refer to Israel as a assembly, they used the Greek word for church. And so now when they, they came here, in Acts, and said, uh, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness, talking about the assembly of the, of the people of God. Okay? Acts 11, 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, and he should go as far as Antioch, to the church in Jerusalem. You can't, you can't be an island yourself and then have stuff come to the ears of the group, of the group and, and, they, and then you help send somebody when you're not there. Right. There is, there is this important uh, function of the assembly of the believers. Acts eleven twenty six. And when they had found him, they brought him to Antioch. When it came to pass, they, a whole year, they assembled themselves uh, with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So they, they assembled themselves with what? The church. The, the a group of people. Now, we would call the building, we call our buildings a church, and there is a reference to that. Primarily, the church is the gathering of people. Our, we are a church. If we meet here this Sunday, great. If we have to go somewhere else the following Sunday, we're still Faith and Victory Church. We're still that group of believers. Okay? Um, Acts 12, 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but the prayer was made without ceasing. Of the church unto God for him. Acts 13, 1. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teaching. Now, see, now we're seeing that there are churches in locales. We see two scriptures already, the church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch. There are two different locations that refers to the church there. Okay? So if you are the church, and that's, and that's what the Bible is all talking about with your shallow interpretation of scripture. Well, I'm the church. There is an element of truth there. But if you're the church, then you're not in Jerusalem. Antioch at the same time, so it's not, can't be talking about that here. Okay? It's the collective body of believers in that location. 
And I don't want to use that term because we use that now in, in socialistic. But it is, it is the group, the fellowship, the uh, total. Of those people who were believers. Praise the Lord. Um, so there was down in the church in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, and um, such as Barnabas. Simeon, which is called Niger, and Lucius and of Cyrene and Manion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Glory to God. Amen. Can you say amen? Um, let's see what we know here. Acts 14, 27. And when they were come. Uh, uh, Sorry. I wanted to get y'all shared out. Get this shared out. I didn't get it shared out. Praise the Lord. And. Go. And Jesse caught me off guard so fast I forgot to share. It's all your fault, Jesse. Are we having problems? Yeah. yeah. All right. Another reason for no build, our own building with our own internet, that we can go stack. We can get a static IP address and we can do what we want to do. All right. Okay. Acts 14, 27. And when they would come, they had gathered the church together. And at first, all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So here, gathered the church together. That group of people made up the church. And they were individuals, but they make it up together. It's a collective joining of that church. You are a member of the body of Christ. Okay? But collectively, we make up the local church. And the local churches collectively make up the universal church, mm -hmm. the church as a whole. All right? So we are not a different church, as it were, um, than the church in Estonia, in Tallinn. Um, the church is there. That church is, is still part of the body of Christ. So the universal church. <coughs> or the collective church makes up the entire body of Christ. All right. Um, Acts 15, 4, when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared unto them all things that God had done to them. Verse 22, then it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church to send, for, send chosen men to their own church. Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, named the Jews, named uh, surname Persabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Acts 18, 22. Mm -hmm. And when he landed in Caesarea, he had gone up and saluted the church. He went down to Antioch. Now think about that. I'm the church. Paul came up and saluted you. One person. Right. No, he, he saluted the He came and greeted the, uh, the assembly. Okay? Uh, Acts 18, 22. And when they had landed at Caesarea, I'm sorry, Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. What is that? He refers to the church as the flock that this indivi these individuals were made overseers of. Mm -hmm. Local pastors mm -hmm. were made overseers over local congregations, over local flocks of the church. We use different terminology many times. Congregation, you know, uh, you get the Society of Friends, you get um, the the uh, the fellowship, you know, we get like like uh, life Christian fellowship. That's just a generic. You, you see that a lot of countries. You start saying that um, we refer to things as a fellowship, but we're still talking about the church. Okay, may I use the ecclesiastical uh, uh, the word? I can't remember if it's ecclesiastical or not, but no, no, it's, it's a it's a Greek word means church. Can we translate church? Okay. Um. At Romans 16, 1, I commend you in the Phoebe. Who is a servant of the church, which is at where? Caesarea. Now we have three different places, four different places that we have read that refer to locations. And people there, and so uh, smart, and so uh, smarter than everybody else. You know, that we said stuff that just, you know, if you just did a little bit deeper study, you could prove that you were just, you're being foolish. Okay, and and really being arrogant because you know everything. You know I know everything because I'm a word of faith person. Uh, I I hate to tell you, honey, I know some Baptists know more about salvation than you ever thought of. Uh, you know, so don't don't get don't don't get your uh, knickers in a twist. Okay, all righty. Uh, let's look at First Corinthians. <coughs> babies chapter 10 verse 32 now we talked about churches and location listen to this um, give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor 
to the church of God. Now we're talking about the universal church. Remember I said to you there's churches and locations. There's buildings. So the word is used these different ways. And then there is the collective, the whole, the body of Christ, the church of God. Yeah. Not the denomination, the church of God. I mean, you know, and, and I get that. You know, they, they name themselves the church of God. You've got the church of God in Christ, the church of God, church of God of prophecy, worldwide church of God, church of Christ, you know. Um, we got all kinds of names. Faith and Victory Church, you know. We got Episcopals, we got Presbyterians, we got Catholics, we got Wesleyans, we got uh, Methodists, we got, you know, uh, Presbyterian Missouri Synod, we got Presbyterian Church of America, we got Presbyterian USA, we got, um, you know, we got them. We got Baptists. We got Southern Baptists. We got Pentecostal Free Will Baptists. We got Free Will Baptists. I mean, we got Independent Baptists. You know, we, there's all kinds. Oh, primitive. Huh? Yeah. They don't know if you're going to heaven or not. You got to wait. You got to wait for Jesus to come back. Find if you're going to make it. And while you spit in the spit tune. Hallelujah. Huh? Pass the cup around the car. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 11, 18. Uh, for, first of all, when you come together in the church. Now listen. Come together in the church. First of all, when you come together. Now earlier, he referred to the people coming together as the church. Here, he's referring to them to come together in the church. So, um, we're getting an idea here. Paul uses references to the uh, the church as people, the gathering of people, uses it as the building, uses it as a group of people in an area, uses it as everybody who's born again together com combined. We get the, we begin to see that you know the church is all those things put together. Can you say glory to God? Hallelujah. And so we want we want to understand that um, when Paul did that. He wasn't trying to be uh, fancy or, you know, mix you up or get you all confused and all those kind of things. He was just using that term in, in different ways to refer to uh, aspects of our life as believers. Now, individually, um, we are part of the body of Christ, so in, in, in a sense of the word, we are the church, are part of the church. Collectively, we're a part of the, or we are the local church. Worldwide, the local churches are, are the church. But the building we meet in is the church. It is not unscriptural to call the building the church and to, and to kind of try to be cute. I, I, don't, I don't need to go to a building because I am the church. Everybody say SOS. You all know what that means? What? Stupid on steroids. That's right. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Um, and God has set some in the church. Now here, he's referring to ministry gifts that are in the body. He's not talking about a building. He's talking about the, the gifts that are set in the, the collective body. Okay? Apostles, prophets, and so forth. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth, not, uh, edifieth himself. He that prophesies edifies the church collective body not individuals i'd rather you speak with tongues um and he goes and says that the church may re receive edification verse 12 um to the edifying of the church verse 19 um yet in the church i had rather speak five words with my understanding not to the church but in the church when we're gathered together in the building i'm in that building i'd rather speak five words of my understanding than ten thousand words in tongues okay that I may teach others also. Praise the Lord. Uh, verse 23 of this same chapter. Um, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place, again we're referring to assembly, verse 28, uh, but if, he, if there be utterance, let him keep silence in the church. Not to the church, but in the church, in the building. In the group that's gathered in that building, in the church. Okay? Verse 35. Um, if they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for the women to speak in the church. Not to the church, in the church. Okay? Now this, <clears throat> if you do some study, you'll find out there's a little bit of a history here other than 
just blankly reading the King James and, and with a Western mind going, well, we shut up, y'all can't talk in church, y'all are, rah, 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 rah. There, there, back in that day, the women and men sat separately. The word for wife and the word for woman in the Greek are the same. When it refers to the wife, it uses the word for woman. Context tells you if it's talking about a wife or a woman. Here, we know, this is what we're talking about wives, because it says, what? Let a master husband's a home. All right? So, this can't be a reference that women can't speak, because then only the married women would be able to ask their husbands. The unmarried women would just be left dumb. That's not the point. They would actually talk out loud, because they didn't understand something being said. They asked their husband, hey, what, you know, Joe, what did he mean? Carry across the other side of the room. He said, ask your husband at home. This is not order. Now remember, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, a lot, the major portion of this letter is corrective on conduct in the church. How you conduct yourself at church. Uh, his letters to the church at Corinth dealt with how they received the Lord's table how the gifts are supposed to operate, how you're not supposed to, everyone get up and try to give a word, to give a, an interpretation, and give a prophecy. So this is corrective in their behavior. Be, and, and remember, he commended them at the beginning and said, you come behind in no gift. We, guys, y'all, you guys just don't come behind in anything. But, and then, then, then he went on for the next few chapters, the rest of them, <laughs> Talking about what they needed to do to get things straight. Because they were out of order. Okay? There was no order in what they were doing. Okay? And for women or, or anybody. I mean, can you imagine? Now, Melanie wouldn't do this. I know. I love Melanie. Melanie wouldn't do this. Say we were in church. That, you know, you had men, Jeff on one side and Melanie on the other. And right in the middle of church, I said something. And Melanie, didn't, Melanie didn't quite get it. She didn't say, Jeff, what's he talking about? I'm just going to let her, and then read it out loud, right? What do you mean? <laughs> what? Well, that's out of order. It's disruptive. Go home and ask. Wait till after church. Don't do it that way. And um, so, hallelujah. We don't sit on the other side of the room now. Aren't y'all glad? All right. What was that? Don't you talk to him during church now. All right. 15.9, uh, uh, Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles, not meet to be called an apostle because I, am persecuted, I persecuted the church of God. Now, here's referring to the collective church. He persecuted any Christian anywhere he could. Okay. 16.19, um, we have here. Um, the churches of Asia, and that's the different of Asia Minor particularly, uh, salute you. So we and um, with Aquila and Priscilla salute you uh, much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Okay, so the gathering of people at their house was the church. There were churches in Asia, different locations. They were there, so he used plural to refer to these different places, these different locales. Second Corinthians one one. Paul writes and says, Paul an apostle by the will of God, Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Again, referring to church at Corinth. Look at Galatians chapter 1. That is General Electric Power Company. Somebody told me that years ago. That's how you remember how the order of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Um, for you have heard of my conversation in verse 13. In time past of the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul again referring to that same thing he referred to in Corinthians, the, the universal church that he had persecuted. Going over to Ephesians chapter 1. Now I would say we probably have more scriptures about the church than we do about um, your spouse or your family. But there's still, you know, we, we still understand priorities, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Um, he put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head of all things to the church. That is the universal body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 
10. And we have here in verse 10, to, to, intent, to the intent now that unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Again, the collective whole of the body of Christ all together. So we, we have letters that Paul wrote. His letters were written to individual churches, local churches. Okay? And then there's references made in these letters to the church as a whole. In other words, this, is just, this isn't just for you. It's a, this is a body of Christ thing. Okay? Um, verse 21, uh, unto him be glory in the church. All right, glory to God. Hallelujah. 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, the universal church. 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, the universal church. 25. Husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church. 27. That he might present himself a glorious church. 29. Um, for no man ever yet hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. All universal, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The these are all in reference to the universal church. Okay? And then Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Paul, again, talking about uh, how he persecuted the, the, the universal church. Anywhere he could find Christians, he persecuted them. He was persecuting churches. He would do anything. He hated the church, the people in the church. Uh, 4.15. Um, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, which when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Again, he's talking about local congregations. No local congregation helped him out. Okay? Uh, Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. The body, now here, here we get clarity. The body of Christ is the church universal. Okay, Paul makes it clear. So understand. So are y'all getting anything yet? You begin to see how how we talk about the church, the church, the church, the church. Um, the the everything that was revolved around the church, the gathering of the saints, in whatever location. Some were in houses, some were in buildings, some were in whatever places. But there was a gathering of the saints, and many times. You know, they broke bread daily. They were, they were meeting every day in the, in, the, in the early days. Too bad we can't do that now. You know, I mean, the grave could meet every day. Not, not for, a, you know, come to the confession booth and, and confess your sins. But the, but the entire, now remember, when after the persecution, they, they bought all the stuff, sold it, and gave it to the apostles' feet, and it was distributed daily. They lost everything. A lot of the Jews lost everything. They lost, they lost their, um, their inheritance. They lost their family name. They were disowned. And so that gathering of all the, you know, when they brought all this stuff to the apostles' feet and laid it at their feet and they, and they began to minister that out, uh, they, they, had to, they were having to take care of them, you know, themselves because they were just cut off. They were cut off from their families. Some were wealthy and they, and they, and they brought their stuff because it helped fund those who, who were just didn't have anything. And what... Uh, um, some may refer to it as communism, but it was a, it was an unusual circumstance. It was still administered, okay, only because it, everything else they had been taken away from them. They were absolutely taken away from them. They were destitute of family. You know, they lost their fam, their mother, their father, their brother, their sister. They were some of them had funerals and buried buried a casket or buried whatever to say that that child was dead. And, you know, because they, they no longer existed. Okay? Jesus, Jesus said they're going to be, boy, and we, we think because we get saved and our family thinks we're a little strange, we've, we've gone through something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So here we, found, we just found out that he, Christ is the head of the body, which is the church. That is the church. Okay? Verse 24. Now we now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So we get to Colossians and Paul begins to bring clarity that in reference to the body of Christ, he's talking about the universal church. 
And if we go to Ephesians and we read Ephesians chapter 4, we, get, we, get, we understand we being many are one body. We may be in many congregations, we be in many individuals, whatever, but we make up one body, the universal church. You are not the church by yourself, technically. You're a part. Okay? You are a part. And that whole, look, at, we're going to stop there. We're going to kind of move over to Ephesians real quick in Ephesians 4. We'll move back over there. I think we've, we've now found, and there's, there's more scriptures. I've got another about 30 here that, or 20 that I can read. We won't do it, okay? I'm, I don't I'll promise you, but we won't do it. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start, um, we'll start in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And we can see there Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the calling, you know, the vocation wherewith ye are called. Ephesians chapter 1, um, you got a vocation. Did you see that? Literally a calling. Okay. Walk worthy of it. He says to walk worthy of it. Did y'all hear me? Now, what, what is this? Remember, we, when we study Ephesians, we, when we've done studies on Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 are who we are, what we have, what we possess in Christ, what we're, where we're positioned. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is the application of how to live out that new creation reality. And, one of the, and Paul begins that transition with, uh, I'm the prisoner of the Lord, and I beseech you, I beg you, walk worthy of the calling that you're called. And he gives instruction with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Stop. We got whole denominations built on there's one baptism. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus only because of this Scripture. This scripture right? This is the scripture. When you study it out, we know there's three different baptisms talked about in the New Testament. There is one baptism of salvation. That is baptism into the body of Christ. For by one spirit are y'all baptized into one body. But then John the Baptist said that Jesus would come, come along and baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. And then we're, to, we're commanded to baptize in water. So, this, if, if we've got three, if you add the baptism of fire, four New Testament baptisms, then it can't be referring to there's only one baptism in the New Testament. There is one salvation baptism. That is baptism into the body of Christ. Okay? Um, one God and Father of all who is above all and all through y'all. Yeah, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it also that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What do we know from Paul's writing to the church at Colossae? What is the body of Christ? What is it? What other word is used to, to, to refer to the body of Christ? According to what Paul, we just read from the Colossians. The church. Okay? He said in Colossians chapter 1, verse, I believe, 24, you know, that it, it was the, uh, the, the church, which is his body. And so here Paul writes and says that we all come to the knowledge of the perfect man, to the measure of the fullness of the stature, of the measure of Christ. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 12. For the edifying of the body of Christ, or for the edifying of the church. This is the universal body. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things 
Now here we get. Now understand that we see that the pastors, the prophets, evangelists, teachers, apostles are given to mature the saints, to become to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So we're no more children. We're not tossed to and fro. And then we get to verse 15 and begins to talk about why. One of, the, one of the drawbacks, one of the failures in a large portion of our word of faith churches was the all about me thing. I'm go to church to get healed. I go to church to prosper. I go to church to get blessed. I go to church. You know, I'm blessed. I'm healed. I'm pro all good, all great. But why are you blessed? Why are you learning the word? Uh, so I can believe God for a new car. Uh-huh. Not quite. Those, those things are, are, are part are a side really venue to what the whole main purpose is. They're not the main. And we may and that's why we receive so much criticism from other non charismatic word of faith churches because all they could look at is see all our heart was for our new car. They didn't see a heart for life. Now I um we were we were pastor not pastor but my, uh, brother Mark Hankins um Monday night a week ago. We went when we got in front royal he was preaching we went in service and um he was sharing some things and Talking about how he went to a, a um, in um, New Zealand to minister, and there's a pastor there, and um, they played the video of the pastor. It's pretty, pretty it's hilarious. His pastor's like, you know, he came, he didn't come to take anything. He, he, he says, <coughs> he got up after us talking about, you know, I, when I go to these places, I don't go to get anything. He says a lot of people go to, they're trying to take up offerings to you know fund their ministry and stuff. He said, I don't need any money. I've come to give. And, you know, he, he gave, uh, in one place, he gave thousands of dollars and stuff. He gave, I forgot how many, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of books and stuff to the pastors and stuff. Just gave it to them. He didn't come to take money out of their churches and take money out of the country. He brought. See, I can handle people prospering with that mindset. But if all you can think about is what you can get out of it and not, the, and I'm going to tell you something, the heart behind why you're using your faith has everything to do with it. And let me prove it to you. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The motivating, undergirding factor of the use of your faith is love. It's okay be blessed if that's all you can think about you're not going to walk in what god has for you i'm under grace god's gonna do it anyway let me tell you, come back to me a few years let me have that worked out for you because i know a lot of people who thought those kind of things years ago and it didn't work out for them all right they weren't using their faith no they weren't walking in love the motivating factor wasn't love now notice he says, for the perfecting of the, uh, so, uh, for the, perfecting of the saints, why, why do we mature saints? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, to welcome in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature, perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, um, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Verse 16, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in him in all things which is the head, from whom the whole body, what, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, unto the edifying of itself in love. The church receives nourishment, sustaining, and gifts, we, we, are, we receive and give, we receive and give. We receive edification, we give nourishment, we supply. We receive from Christ who ministers through the body. The body ministers to itself. The body then ministers out. Hello. This gathering place of, called the church. I don't go to church because there are a bunch of hypocrites there. <clears throat> Come on and join me. You'd be just like them. 
There's such a uh, arrogant statement that you're you're the only one who's not who's not a hypocrite. You're you're perfect. You know, you're 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 awesome. You're amazing. You and you're you're robbing those hypocrites of the supply that you could bring that would bring help that would help them. It's just a this is a long term lie of the devil. It really is. Somehow or another, we expect church people to be Jesus. Now, our goal is to strive to be like Jesus. If that was true, it was automatic. Paul wouldn't have wrote 1st or 2nd Corinthians and probably the 3rd and 4th letters of the church of Corinth that we, we know is probably stuck, probably out there. We just never got them. Very, very highly likely it was four letters. Okay? They just didn't find the other two. All right. If, if 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 that was automatic and everybody became so just I mean super saint, he wouldn't have the right to let them and straighten them out for how they got together and acted. Okay. We are to gather together. Your your ability to be a good employee at work is is really tied to your relationship to your local church and learning the character of Christ and the nature of Christ and how to live like him. You can carry that into the into your workplace. Okay. Now I was told recently that um, you know, by someone that I was the best person they had ever hired. I don't I don't attribute that to just being a you know a great work ethic person. I attribute to the character and integrity I got in the church. Doing all things as unto the Lord. Whatever I do in word or deed, do it to the Lord. Okay? And uh, that's important. How we conduct ourselves in the workforce is going to be greatly measured because of how we have been taught, trained and taught in the church. That's why the church is, that's why it comes before your job. It's important that you are edified and built up and strengthened and taught to love and these things so that when you go to your workplace, your workplace is also a mission field. Now, I mean, you got to carry your Bible in there and stand up at the lunchtime and go, ye generation of vipers and snakes. <laughs> like the guy did up made in about 20 years ago. He even got on that national television from doing it. Y'all, anybody remember that? Yeah, his, his, son, his son was the one that he really got it going because he was standing under the principal's office, open, the open window of his principal's office, and start screaming, you generation of vipers and snakes, and <clears throat> they suspended him. Rightfully so. And then the dad was standing on the street corner and do it. And they got him on the Morton Downey Jr. show, The Mouth, and had him on there, and that's, you know, and... Uh, you know, and he was preaching. You're not preaching Christ. Okay, not not the way he was doing it. Okay. Anyway, there's a time and place for everything. But your your job is evangelistic. But you go into the break and start calling them a bunch of generation of vipers and snakes to see what happens. But. Live, live your life. Well, it probably won't be a Christmas party. It'll be a, a, a party party. Just use, use your Christmas to get away with it. Uh, another, another time to get drunk. All right. That's right. And try that while they're sitting there drinking their, their Mogan David 2020 or Mad Dog 2020 and some Richard's Wild Irish Rose Wine. There's a reason they call it Mad Dog. It makes you crazy. I saw that on, uh, somebody put on Facebook. They had Richard's Wild Irish Rose, Mad Dog 2020. And a bunch of other bottles up there. And say, anybody remember this? They go, oh my, why would you even try to remember that stuff? I mean, uh, that, was for, that was for the people who, who were drunks who didn't have any money to buy anything with. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So, anyway, the body comes together. The church is your fourth priority of life. It is your interaction place. Doesn't mean you can't interact with other people, but that's not that's not your that's not your confidant. That's not your close circle. That's not the place you go to get ministered to to get strength. 
to get equipped, to be able to share your heart. You don't share. Don't go. Don't go telling unbelievers that you, you know somebody at church did you wrong. Well, that's why I stopped going. I'm going to tell you what's the truth. Bunch of hypocrites over there. If I were you, I'd just go. I quit. Yeah, and I'd tell them off on the way out the door too. I'd pull a Harper Valley PTA thing. The day my daddy socked it to the congregation at FEC. Boom, boom. All right, you know, some of y'all don't remember the Harper Valley PTA. Okay. You young folks have no idea what I'm talking about. Don't even bother going and looking it up. It's out there. You know. But they all talked about the woman, and she went down to the PTA meeting one night and told them all off. You know, and they were a good song. Kind of like that Please Let Me Sing in the Choir song. People love get back songs. Dug my keys into the side of your souped-up four-wheel drive. Carved my name into your leather seats and all that kind of stuff. What's her name? Carrie Underwood? or Yeah. Got famous off that song. Huh? Next time you cheat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to dig my keys into the side of your four uh, yeah. Get, 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 get. yeah. Shit, shit. I know they say, you know, they got a movie by my... Uh, um, a Tyler Perry called Diary of a Mad Black Woman. But I'm going to tell you, uh, same kind of spirits on them country redneck white, uh, redneck women, too. Got about the same devil on them. <laughs> they go crazy. You get cray-cray. Hallelujah. Amen. So at the local church, how how important is it? It's it's a priority. It's the fourth priority of life. It comes before your job. Now, you don't miss everything in your kid's life. You don't, miss, you don't do anything. You never do anything with your wife because you've got to be at church. I miss Sunday. You know, I wasn't going to be here, but my wife said, I got to get back and get all the stuff out to everybody for vacation Bible school. Okay. Yeah, yeah so here we are. Here we, we, we were there, you know. And, but I did call Jeff and said, Go ahead. Go ahead with it, brother. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to preach Sunday. You know, we're, we're, you know, if we get back, and, and I didn't tell him we might get back, but I won't plan on getting back. I'm just going to be honest with you. But she felt like she had to get everybody with vacation Bible school. I said, honey, we'll go to the house and take it to them on Monday. Uh-uh. Had to get it done. And you, she was acting like Larry the Cable Guy. Get her done. All right. We love y'all. God bless you. Join us next week as we talk about, huh? Oh, we're going to take up the offering. If you would give, that's going out on the thing. And then, you know, whenever that happens, remember to uh, join us next time as we talk about uh, – uh, the last priority, or fifth priority, but not the only priority, but five priorities. Like fifth uh, uh, in importance is your local, is your job and your local employment. Praise the Lord. We'll talk about that next week. And uh, if you, as you're giving, we bless you in Jesus' name. And heaven's windows are open unto you, and pours out blessings on you. You don't have room enough to receive. Praise God. And uh, they're putting out there right now how to do it electronically. And uh, we love you. God bless you. All right, guys, y'all ready? You know, anybody need an offering envelope? Anybody see, uh, ringing that electronically? All right. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the offering, Father. The people are blessed abundantly. Amen. Glory to God. And amen. Praise God. All right. Well, we'll see you guys on Saturday. Everybody say Saturday. At uh, 9.30, we, we can get in here at least by 9.30, if not earlier. If you want to come a little bit earlier, it won't, I, I'm just going to guarantee you're not going to be told no. Okay? They can say, we got room at 9.30, they're going to let us in. Because they open at 9 on Saturdays, I think. Okay, they open at 9 on Saturdays. There ain't nobody renting the room for 30 minutes. Okay, so we'll be able to get in and start setting up. Uh, if you get here that early, get here earlier or whatever, that's okay. Just this room. And then.